You know what? Back to the whole Green Goblin thing. I was really upset when, like, they're playing out this character. He's dying. Clearly he has sores growing on him. Like, he is at the end, it's almost, when he needs to go and get this spider venom in order to in- have someone else inject it into him to, like, keep him alive. He suddenly is in spasms, like, just writhing on the floor, looks up and sees this state-of-the-art armor that's for military use and is somehow able to crawl into it, put it all on. He even, like, it shows a scene where, like, it drills into his head, this piece. You can hear the zzzz and see a small screw and he's up and running and we're good to go and I can go fight Spider-Man now and I'm not twitching anymore because the secret suit healed me. Why didn't you just jump into that suit in the first place? That's a and also just for a second, can we talk about Spider-Man being a dick to Harry Osborn? We're like, I get the whole like, oh, but you know, maybe I I shouldn't be just like tossing my blood around willy nilly. But <laughs> I, he had so many better options about dealing with the Harry Osborn wants my blood thing than what he did. Uh, like for example, Peter Parker was immediately like, well, like Harry, we can't like that would be so bad. Like you can't. I'm not gonna ask Spider-Man. Uh, here's an idea, Peter. Why don't you just say like. Why don't you just say yes and then not do it? That's a really ridiculous thing to ask of it. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, if I see Spider-Man, if I see this insane vigilante who never talks to anybody, then I might ask him and then just not do it. Or alternatively, if he's going to be... Once he got to that point, why did Spider-Man have to go visit Harry Osborn in person and, like, go to his house, oh, no. knock on his window, and rub it in his face to, like, no. I he didn't, heard, he didn't I even knock on the window, though. <laughs> I want you to know I heard that you need my blood to save you. I just came here in person to say, nah, I don't feel like it. There is no, this motivation. There is this motivation to become Green Goblin. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That was a dick moment on Spider-Man's part. But, like, Spider-Man was even more of a dick because he went in and woke him up. He's like, Harry, <laughs> Harry, wake up. Please, Harry, wake up. <clears throat> Guess what? I'm not going to help you. <laughs> so let me tell you guys a little story here. When we were in the theaters, we're watching it, and there's, like, there's a shit ton of kids. And there's, like, a lot of female audience members, too. And when Gwen Stacy dies, you know, there's an audible silence, except for this one girl in the theater who was bawling her face off. Like, she was full out crying. And I was like, I felt bad because I knew that was going to happen. Did she not know? No, like, well, she clearly had no clue it was coming. Um, But then, so, you know, everything kind of calms down a little bit. She's not crying as much. And then (laughs) he picks up the USB and it says Gwen's speech on it. And you hear, I guess, from the same girl in this sobby kind of, like, I've been crying my face off voice go... Oh, God, why? (laughs) (laughs) And I know she probably started crying her face off again because, like, how could you not? But, yeah, that's my little side story. Okay. here My problem with it is that, like, every superhero movie, because they're based on comics that have a huge lore and to a certain extent we know what's going to happen, they feel like they have to have this ironic foreshadowing. And sometimes they shoehorn it in in places where it doesn't really make a ton of sense. Like, for Gwen Stacy's graduation speech, it was lit the whole time. She's talking, like, I know that we, like, we feel immortal. And which, like, okay, yeah, like, we get it. You're going to die in the future. And we're so worried that we might fall short of what we think we could. Oh, my God, come on. But then even beyond that, it got to the point where who says the things she was saying in a – who's like, you're graduating high school and going off to college. There are going to be dark times ahead. It's your job as you go off to college to act as a shining beacon of hope to the people of this city. Become like, hope. Become abstract concepts. <laughs> he was clearly reading that speech just for Peter. And yeah. he was the only person that wasn't there to listen to it. You write that guy a letter. Post it on your Tumblr, Quint Stacy. There's a better time and a place for that. You're the valedictorian. Get your shit together. Uh, Tum- Tumblr is not the thing she should use. <laughs> After watching it, he's like, I'm Spider-Man again. And you're like, okay, (laughs) great. All right, so Sinister Six. What do you think? 
that's an, I'm so happy that they're doing that. And the nice, uh, it, it like it sucks that Marvel doesn't own all of the big properties and different studios are making all the movies because it means we can't have the crossovers that we want. But the nice part of it is that because they only have the Spider-Man universe, we're getting these like crazy niche movies, and I want to see that. Um, but the flip side to it, I think it's kind of funny how they're setting it up, where none of these aren't like individual characters who. Like, Dr. Octopus ma makes so much sense as, like, a science experiment gone wrong. But the Sinister Sticks all starting out as Oscorp experiments. It was, like, what was their science division doing that they were like, we want you to create the ultimate weapon, and we're going to model them after the most deadly animals in the world. Uh, okay, most deadly animals. Uh, like an octopus? Can we do an octopus weapon? Uh, what a bird, a bird weapon that would be like. Just, just make guns, Oscorp. Why are you? What is this for? See, Norman Osborn really had some kind of animal fetish, and he was really into that whole scene. So that's probably why he yeah, just like it was a secret little thing that he had, and he took it with him when he died. You know, it's his claws. That seems to be a strange sub like sub theme of these movies that everybody has some weird animal connection. Spider Man is from experimenting with spiders, Lizard is experimenting even Electro is I don't know if that's a thing in the comics, the but eels. the fact that his yeah, his origin is electric eels. You know, in the comics yeah. in the comics they actually did a like animal uh spirit animal tie in thing for a while there and it was like it at first it was kind of interesting because Peter actually turned into a spider, but I heard then about that. It, it kind of went weird, mm -hmm. and there was like these spider totems, and I, I, I got lost after a oh, while, and I just, animal man. I very, I just walked away. Yeah, it was kind of, yeah, it was weird. All right, and uh, okay, not to toss another question out at you guys, but uh, how did you feel about the Days of Future Past? And I'm going to use this word uh, loosely, stinger. Like that, that little what we'll call advertisement uh, that was you know buried in the the credits there. I, I I thought it was very much bland. It just was like here's a piece of a trailer you haven't seen yet and mostly have seen though. It was just more product placement for the movie, so it like it just flowed right through. I heard that the film companies just like owed each other a favor or something. It was kind of weird, especially because they take place in different universes. Yeah, I'm sure it was just a back. I think it, I heard it was just a sort of back office, you know, monetary deal. They just said, "Yeah, we'll give you money, and you put this in your movie." Mm. It felt very abrupt. Like as you're watching the credits, <laughs> you're just watching credits, and then all of a sudden, it's like, "Holy crap!" There's something happening, and it's not even related to a thing that you might be excited to see if you're there for Spider-Man specifically. And I mean, Days of Future Past is going to be exciting, and we're all going to watch it and then do a, another video like this. But it's not its not related to Spider-Man, so why is it there? Well, it's because it's for the people that aren't us, the ones that don't aren't there for comics. They're there for these action movies, and they go and then they see it, and some people don't know that necessarily there's a new X-Men coming up because all they know is necessarily Spider-Man. And so all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, oh, I have to go take... Billy to go see this awesome superhero movie. Look at all these crazy things that are going on. It's so weird. Uh, did I just hear you say you're taking Billy to the movies? I will take Billy to the movies. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, no problem, Billy. <laughs> so, okay, and the overall length, I thought it was a little bit long. I think we were we were talking earlier about uh, that whole uh, airplane air traffic control scene where, um, you know, it was not... Un not unlike in the first movie where uh, Spider-Man saves the boy in the car on the bridge and that guy, the, the father turns out to be a crane operator and then later in the movie all the crane operators in the first Amazing Spider-Man turn their booms over 6th Street or, or 6th Ave or whatever it was and then uh, he uh, swings all down and goes uh, to Oscorp. But in this one it was like Spider-Man plugs in some wires and then the power comes back on and then air traffic controllers do their job <laughs> like it, it, it was a bit just like filler. It's like someone told him his movie had to be two hours and twenty minutes long instead of two hours, and he's like, "I have to fill it with something." Well, I think that they were trying to show like like Spider Man's act. Like these are like it's not just he's dealing with Electro. Like the whole city, your people are dying, and these are the stakes. But the fact that they just focused on one plane the whole time was it. 
It was strange that that was like a little vignette. It builds tension, but it's not like. I think it builds tension because maybe the fight scene that we might have been watching instead lacked that tension. Yeah, I would have been more interested, though, if someone on that plane was someone I cared about. Like, you know what I mean? Like, maybe, like, yeah, they mentioned, like, Felicia uh, Hardy, you know, which is obviously a black cat, uh, or maybe Alistair Smythe, or, you know, some someone of some future potential importance was on that plane, and maybe they were going somewhere to do something important, and then if that plane had crashed, it would have altered events in some way, instead of, you know... Spring Break 2014 on its way to Miami. Like, you know what I mean? Like, who gives a crap? I don't know these people. You haven't introduced them before now. So or why like, the beginning of the movie where Spider-Man, like, he finds the pink teddy bear with its eye coming out in his pool. And you, what is this? And, oh, oh, my God. <laughs> but there's another scene in the movie that I felt could have been cut, too. And even though some, you might say that this was a pivotal part, was the birthday party. Like... I felt that that was not necessary for the, like, creation of that character. Like, I understand he's got some obsession with Spider-Man, but, like, why? Why does he need to have this obsession? Like, th clearly this character was written completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, Max Dillon is some kind of sociopath. Like, it's it just didn't play right. Like, he was never like that in the comic books. Yeah, it felt like they could have just as easily done, like, oh, this guy wants power and Spider-Man's in his way. So he mm -hmm. hates Spider-Man now. That would have made a lot of sense without having to do all that crazy bullshit to get there. Yeah, I mean, like, in the comic books, from what I remember of the original Electro from back in the day, was he was just this guy who kept getting the short end of the stick. His life was pretty much just crappy. Wait, and was an accident happened, and he got power. And it was the power that he never had in his life that he was now able to wield and, like, control situations, which I thought would have been a lot better than this, like, uber geek who, like, I, they, oh, it was just so weird and uncomfortable, and he gets an accident, and then he's dead, and he's alive, and I don't know. And the, the transitions of his power, like, moving through electricity and appearing behind people, like, it was so slow when he appeared behind people people, and, oh, there he is. I thought it was badass. I thought he was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Electricity moves faster than that. I think visually, it was very, like, the choice of Electro as a villain visually made for some really awesome visuals, oh. especially in 3D, so it wasn't just, like, if you can ignore the fact that the character's motivations feel kind of forced and weird, then you get a really you get a pile of really awesome fight scenes. So yeah. mm -hmm. your reward for ignoring for suspending your disbelief is awesome. I do I a hundred percent agree with you there. Like for all the things that I'm making fun of, that Electro at those fight scenes were amazing. All of those parts I enjoyed them so much. Yeah, I, actually, I almost felt like when Electro was moving around his powers were almost more neon-based than actual electricity-based, because that's what it seemed. It seemed like I was following this trail of neon lights throughout New York City as Spider-Man, and not electricity. Like They definitely didn't have the same properties in terms of speed or damage. Like I tend to believe that magnetizing your wrists doesn't save you from 100,000 volts. But that's I'm just, pretty, right. that's just but, it was, but it was so cool! But it gives him arthritis. <laughs> I All right, well, don't know how anyone could survive this. Like he took a whole lot of electricity to his body. They really pushed him having this healing ability in this movie, though. Like they mentioned a couple times that Spider-Man now has the ability to self-heal. No, but Rab's right. Neoprene will save you if the entire electrical grid of New York City flows through your veins. Neoprene, that'll <laughs> fix that shit right up. 